God of creation makes us one in body. Let, Let us give, give witness, witness in faith, faith hope, and love. love. The God of Christ makes us one in the spirit. Let, Let us worship, worship God in joyful praise. sons. Eternal God, you are the power behind all minds, behind the ability to think and reason, behind all understanding of the truth. Eternal God, you are the power behind the cross of Christ, behind the weakness, the torture, and the death, behind unconquerable love. O oh, changeless God, under the conviction of your spirit, I learn that the more I do, the worse I am. The more I know, the less I know. The more holiness I have, the more sinful I am. The more I love, the more there is to love. My heart is full of affection and yet full of leaks. We are your body and yet we lose track of how we are knit together. Our memory is faulty. We easily forget the lessons learned. And so your truths seep away. Give us broken hearts that even still carry home the waters of grace. Amen. What more could be done than what Christ has done? His death is our life. His resurrection, our peace. His ascension, our hope. His prayers, our comfort. Friends, hear and believe this very good news. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from 1 Corinthians 12, right before the famous love chapter, the one that describes love as patient and kind and never jealous and so on. We'll get to that in the coming weeks, but for today, I want us to focus on what led Paul into that discussion of love. This portion of Paul's letter is one of the instances where he uses the metaphor of the body to talk about the gathering of people we call the church, a community of faith, a congregation. We are, as members of this body, members of the community made one, thanks to the Spirit, whose arrival we marked on Pentecost. We are baptized, all of us, into one body. He goes on to talk about what this means. And we're gonna pick up that conversation in verse 14. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. 
that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? but strive for the greater gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is one of those passages in scripture that reminds us that humans are not designed to go it alone. We are made in the image of the triune God. God is the creator, the son, and the spirit. Three distinct persons in one unified whole, a chord of three stands, strands, a, a never ending dance. We were made to be in families. We were made to be in community, in communion with one another and with God. And so it makes sense that when Paul speaks of the gifts that are given through the Spirit, he reminds us that they come together to meet the needs of the community, to build up the body for the reconciling work that we're called to do together in the world. Do you remember the prayer in John's Gospel back in John 17, when Jesus prayed that generation after generation would hear and respond to the good news of God's love for the world, that all of his believers would be one in love. He prayed that we would be unified in our love for one another and for God so that our eyes would be open to God's deep love for us as part of the world and not solely for us. Because of who God is and what God has given in love to the Son, we can trust that we've been made holy in the truth of the Word made flesh. That sanctification has a greater purpose, bringing together a body that is healthy and whole, that is strong enough to carry on with the work that Jesus started as he embodied God's love among us. Now, there is risk in the plan that God has put into play through the disciples. They might get it wrong. The world might not want to hear. The messengers might be rejected. But still, Jesus sent them. 
Spoiler alert, they got it wrong. The world didn't want to hear, and they were often rejected. But God persisted and still persists in calling and commissioning us because the world remains the object of God's love. Not only as part of the creation that God pronounced good, but as billions of individual people whom God loves uniquely and with whom God longs to be reconciled. Remembering the Ascension and Pentecost, we, we clearly see that the disciples had no choice but to exchange the physical presence of the Word made flesh for God the Spirit. It's also important to recall that Pentecost was not an individual experience. It happened in the plural. The followers gathered in that room in Jerusalem shared the experience of wind and flame as the Spirit came upon them. And while Peter's sermon was the one captured in Luke's account, we know that all of them were speaking in tongues and all were confessing Jesus as Lord. Pentecost is considered the birthday of the church because it marks the day that this first group of followers left the room and went out into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to preach the truth of Jesus as the Son of God. Over time, pockets of believers started growing in numbers. Peter and Paul in particular began helping these groups learn what it meant to be community in the way of Jesus. And that's where this enduring image comes from that has been passed down to us from those earliest days of the Jesus movement. The image of the body of Christ. We embody the will and work and legacy of the one in whom we place our faith. We can understand this individually, since we do each have arms that hug or a voice that can correct or console and eyes that can see people who feel like they've become invisible. But we must, we absolutely must embrace the truth that when we bring our individual skills and gifts and talents and passions and resources together, we become so much more than the sum of our individual Parts. Paul writes that we are all to be honored, all to be celebrated, all to be supported in the love of Christ. It is only as we learn to depend on one another and on the power of the Holy Spirit that we can take our place in the long line of disciples who go out into the world to continue the mission of Christ. As Presbyterians, we place a very high value on the statement that the church is the body of Christ, with Christ himself at the head. Our understanding of the church universal, denominational relationships, and the work of particular congregation flows out of that understanding. I know. We're heading into Presby nerd territory here, but hang with me. There are a handful of statements at the beginning of our Book of Order that provide a framework that I'd like us to use over the next few weeks to explore what it means to be the body of Christ together. These statements um, can be drawn from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth as they call upon the church to be a community of faith, a community of hope, a community of love, and a community of witness. You might recall Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 13 that in the body, when each member is attuned to its role, faith, hope, and love abide. These three remain, they endure, they abide in the body so that together we might bear witness to the world about the truth of the faith, hope, and love we find in Christ. Because what it means to be the body of Christ together right now and in the months and years to come 
I believe, is a little different from what it meant, or at least what it looked like to be the body of Christ in the past. What it looks like will be 100% shaped by context, events, constrictions, all of the things that are happening in our world, but they will always be undergirded by these foundational truths. And they draw from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. We are called as a church to be a community of faith, a community of hope, a community of love, and a community of witness. You might recall Paul's statements in 1 Corinthians 13 that the body, when each member is attuned to its role, that is where faith, hope, and love abide, the greatest of which is love. These three remain, they endure, they abide in the body so that together we might bear witness to the world about faith, hope, and love in Christ. We will also take a look at the heart behind what have historically been called the great ends of the church by the Reformed family of churches. During this series of sermons over the summertime, I invite you to join me for conversations where we can explore these ideas together. I hope to learn from you how Shalot Presbyterian Church has lived out its calling in years past, as well as what you've experienced in other congregations. And I'd like us to describe together what has been happening and what's going on in our community today. And I want to hear how you hope to see this particular congregation being the body of Christ in the years to come. We'll meet on Zoom at first, but hopefully soon we can connect in some safely distant small groups outside on porches or in backyards or maybe even in the picnic area here at church. The time and place that we gather is less important than this a commitment to pray and trust God to reveal to us what we are called to be and do. One more spoiler alert. We're going to get it wrong, at least partly. The world still isn't sure that it wants to hear what we have to say. And we will sometimes find ourselves rejected. But isn't it a beautiful thing that God continues to risk in every generation our learning how to be the body of Christ? May we be faithful in our quest to do so. Amen.
you know, God loved us first so that we might love God and our neighbors. And God provides for us so that we might honor God and bless our neighbors. I thank God and I thank you for continuing to support the ongoing mission of Shalot Presbyterian Church and our partners in mission and ministry in Brunswick County and beyond. Consider anew today how you might share from your abundance to help build up the body and to build the kingdom of God. This summer, as we dig a little deeper into our understanding of who we are as Presbyterians in the Book of Order, uh, we'll also take some time to look at the documents that we share with the church that has come before us in our Book of Confessions. So our Affirmation of Faith week by week will come from a variety of the confessions that we have added to our shared book and our common lives. This week, we will read together a portion of the Theological Declaration of Barman, in particular sections 8.16 through 8.18, speaking of who we are as the church. Let us say what we believe together. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body is joined and knit together. The Christian church is the congregation of the brethren in which Jesus Christ acts presently as the Lord in word and sacrament through the Holy Spirit. As the church of pardoned sinners, it has to testify in the midst of a sinful world with its faith as with its obedience with its message as with its order, that it is solely his property and that it lives and wants to live solely from his comfort and from his direction in the expectation of his appearance. We reject the false doctrine as though the church were permitted to abandon the form of its message and order to its own pleasure or to changes in prevailing ideological and political convictions. We give thanks for these words that we believe. Amen. As we go into a time of prayer for our community and for the world, I invite you to take just a moment to breathe in the air of the Spirit that continues to swirl around us even in this ordinary time, making our time of prayer extraordinary. God most high, God with us, we praise you with every word we speak and with every moment we fall silent. You hear our prayer and sustain us along with all living things. You forgive our sins and bring us close to live in the goodness of your holy presence. We pray for your awesome deeds of salvation for us and to all the farthest edges of the earth. With the strength that raised mountains, calm the roaring seas of conflict, calm the waves of violence and oppression, draw all nations and peoples close to each other. We pray for everyone who longs for your joy, for those who are sick or in pain from morning to night, for those whose grief weighs them down, for those who hunger and thirst for guidance, righteousness, or food. Rain down your love once again, O God. Soften our hearts so that our lives can bear your fruit. 
Crown our lives with your goodness and let everything we do overflow with blessings for your people. Open our eyes that we may see the needs of others. Open our ears that we may hear their cries. Open our hearts that we may feel their anguish and their joy. Let us not be afraid to defend the oppressed, the poor, the powerless, because of the anger and the might of the powerful. Show us where love and hope and faith are needed and use us to bring them to those places. We pray in the name of the one who brings us joy, Jesus, the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as varied as we are, as many as we are, we are one, one body made of all kinds of parts, using all kinds of gifts, empowered by one spirit. Whatever part you play, we need you. God needs you. The world needs you. So go courageously into this week, knowing that you do not go alone. The one who created you, the one who commissions you, is the one who empowers you. So go, love and heal your little corner of the world. Amen. <laughs>